afternoon at 2 o'clock here in the church library. Masks are required for that meeting, uh, so if you were a part of that, please try to join in with the UMW. I got a message the other day from Laura Cross, uh, Laverta Palmer's daughter. Laverta's birthday is coming up on the 29th, and Laura would love it if we would all send Laverta a birthday card. Uh, Laverta's back at Stony Brook Suites there in Huron. If you need that address, we've posted it in the church office window out here, so you can stop by and get that address. Uh, for the youth group, sorry guys that I missed Wednesday. I was uh, homesick, uh, but we will meet this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock here at the church. Are there any other announcements that I'm forgetting this morning? If not, let's tune our hearts and minds to worship as we hear uh, our opening praise song. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are, to worship. Come, just as you are, before your God. Come. One day, every tongue will confess you are God. One day, every knee will bow. Still, the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come just as you are, to worship. Come, just as you are, before your God. Come. Let us pray. O oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. Our psalm reading today is Psalm 103. Listen now for the word of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant 
and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Thus ends the reading. Well, I'd like to invite the children up for children's time. Good morning, girls. How are you? You guys can have a seat if you want. So I have a question for you. Is there anything that you hope that you, you could be really good at someday? What do you think, Will? Um, have a basketball yeah, basketball. I, I was never going to be good at basketball. I'm way too short and slow and uncoordinated. I have all the things that make me not good at basketball. How about you girls? Is there anything you want to be really good at? No? Math? You want to be really good at math? That's a really useful thing to be good at. I always wanted to be a good singer. I'm okay, but I'm not a really good singer. But you know, I, I took piano lessons for many years. Like, I want to say from like first grade through sixth grade, I took piano lessons. And you know what? I was never very good. You know why? Because I didn't practice. I hated to practice. Because I didn't like the way it sounded when I played because I wasn't very good. I wanted to be able to play beautifully, but I wasn't good. But I wasn't good because I didn't practice. Could you shoot a basket the first time you picked up a basketball? No. no. Did you have to work at it a little bit? Yeah. Did you get better? Yeah. yeah. We get better at the things we practice, right? We aren't always going to be good at something the first time we try it. The first time you tried to write your name when you were little, little, do you think you could write your name very well? Can you write your name pretty good now? Right, because you've done it over and over and over and over again. We get better at the things we practice. Well, today our Bible story tells us that there's lots of things we have to practice at to get better. And one of the things that the Bible verse talks about today is generosity and how we share what we have with others. Is it always easy to share what you have with your sisters? No. I bet if I asked Savannah the same thing, she'd say no, too, right? Not easy to share with your sisters? No. Sharing is not something that comes very naturally to us. But if we practice that, if we practice being generous, we'll get better at even that. We'll also get better at following Jesus the more we practice it. Jesus said that we're supposed to love everybody, right? Is that always easy to do? No. No because we get mad, we get frustrated, right? There are some people that are harder to love than others. There are some days that we aren't very loving because we're in a bad mood or crabby. But the more we practice those things, the better we get at it, even following Jesus. And that's good news that we can get better at it. Would you guys say a prayer with me? Hold your hands, bow your heads, and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for helping us learn. Remind us when things get hard that we need to practice. Practice being kind. Practice being loving. And practice being generous. We know you will help us. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. You can head back to your seats. For those of you who are here with us in the church this morning, I hope you had an opportunity to uh, place your tithes and offerings in the plates as you entered today. For those watching at home, 
Uh, you can present your tithes and offerings uh, also by either mailing those in or swinging them by the church office here or by stopping at Coin Bank and setting up automated giving. But now that we have presented our tithes and offerings to God, let us hear these words from the doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray as we dedicate our gifts to God. Part of our being true to you, dear Lord, is trusting our resources and our finances to you. Help us to be true through our giving and our service. May those who came before us lead our way. Amen. Well, folks, we are still in the book of James. Um, James is only five chapters long, and today we are going to hear the last part of chapter four and about the first half of chapter five. So we're getting close. We've almost made our way through the book of James. Today we're going to be listening to James 4, verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 9. Listen now for the word of God. Come now, you who say, oh, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat up your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have any of you heard of Itzhak Perlman? I'm getting a couple, okay. Well, Itzhak Perlman is a world famous violinist. He is an absolute master on the violin. The music that he produces is breathtaking. Well, Itzhak, as a little boy, he grew up in Tel Aviv. And he first laid hands on a toy violin at about the age of three. And he started to teach himself how to play, and his parents noticed that he had a knack for the violin. And so they took him to a, a music school there in, in Tel Aviv, but the teacher said he was too little to be able to hold a violin, so they sent him away. Then when he was four, he contracted polio. But that didn't slow him down. He kept on 
working at the violin, and eventually he did get admitted to the music school. And he gave his first recital at the age of 10, and by 13 he had traveled to New York to study at Juilliard. Itzhak often talks about the importance of practice in getting him where he has been in his life. And he talks about practice as methodical and slow and very intentional. He, t he talks a lot to, to students and upcoming violinists about how he practices. And he encourages others to practice, taking the time to get things right. He shares his amazing gift not only through his performing, but by teaching. He teaches at both the Conservatory of Music in Brooklyn, but also is a resident scholar at his alma mater, Juilliard. He also coaches young talent as part of the Perlman Music Program, which was founded by his wife, as a means of coaching young musical talent of all sorts. Itzhak's life, especially his professional life, personifies the idea that it not only matters what we have, but how we act and how we give back. And that's what James is talking about in our passage today. Really, throughout the entire book of James. You see, throughout James, he notes that our faith shapes our actions and our actions shape our faith. But the question James wrestles with today, and really throughout the whole book, is, is whether or not our interior and our exterior lives are coherent. For a large portion of our passage today, James specifically looks at our relationship to money and how we use our money to bring about justice and freedom for others. Too often, I think, especially here in the West, we want to disconnect our wallets from our faith. But here's James telling us that they are very much connected. Our relationship to our money, our habits in how we use our money are just as connected as Itzhak's Perlman's practice, performance, and teaching. Now our reading began today with a condemnation of those who go about and boast about what they're going to do in the future. And James kind of puts a stop to this because not one of us is guaranteed another day. So we must first approach our reading today with the understanding that our very being is out of our hands. That only God knows what our future holds. And we cannot promise anything about tomorrow, even promises that we make to ourselves. Except to say that God will be there. James says if we have the opportunity to do what is right today, we should do it. Because tomorrow may not come. Why wait to do the right thing? Do it now. Do it today or you may not have a chance. So what is the right thing where our money is concerned? Because that's where James goes next. Well, let's start with what James does not say. James does not say that money in and of itself is a problem. James does not say that wealth of any amount is in and of itself a problem. What James does find a problem with, potentially, is how we use or fail to use the resources that we have. Now, chapter 5 of James began with an image that caused me to pause a little bit. He's telling the wealthy to mourn for what is to come for them. And he tells them that in their future, their gold and silver will have rusted, and that rust will be used as evidence against them. Now, I don't know a lot about metallurgy, but I know that gold and silver don't rust. <laughs> Judy's shaking her head. Nope, they don't. They do not rust. Not pure gold and silver, anyway. So what exactly is James telling us? I believe he is questioning the benefit of having more than we need. What good are money or possessions that we, that we hold on to but never put to use? 
What good is it to simply have things for the sake of having them if they do not benefit us or others or the kingdom? Now, he's not knocking your savings account or your 401k, but at a certain point, do we obtain more than we need? Could we put what we have to better use by easing someone else's suffering? James goes so far as to say that, that to hoard what we have is an act of injustice. And that that will be used as evidence against us. Now, our Western mentality tells us that we can't afford to share what we have with others. Right? We see this all throughout our society. Remember the bumper stickers? He who dies with the most toys wins. You remember those? Right? We have, we're being told on every side that getting all you can is the way we're supposed to live. But a gospel mentality tells us that for our eternal souls, we can't afford not to share. This is a theme that we see throughout all of Scripture. So, so James isn't out on a limb all by himself here. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus himself says that the very model of generosity is the widow who gave her very last two pennies in the synagogue. Jesus also reminds us that God will provide for our future if we are faithful. Just as God provides for the, for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. And of course, in 1 Timothy, we are told in no uncertain terms that the love of money is the root of all evil. I think this passage forces us to examine within ourselves where our priorities lie. Do we value our comfort and ease, our future comfort and ease, above someone else's suffering today? And here's where we get to that practice piece. Because if we begin to give what we can when we can, we learn to place our trust and hope in God. And in return, as our faith grows, we find more ways and more opportunities to give. We don't have to be masters at this today. But we do need to start. Because remember, tomorrow isn't guaranteed. Methodically, intentionally, doing what we can each and every day to counter injustice and oppression and suffering however we can. And I know it can be difficult, especially in the uncertain times that we are living in. It is, it is ingrained in us to gather resources to protect ourselves, to protect our families, to insulate us against the trials of this world. But this passage is a good reminder that too much insulation can be a hazard, and it leads to our condemnation. I once heard a really good way to look at your habits to see if you are giving as much as you can, as much as you think you are. Because quite often, I, I think, at least in my case, we're, I'm a very poor judge of my own behavior. The advice I heard was that there are two things in our lives which will unequivocally show us where our priorities are. Our checkbook and our calendar. Where do we spend our time and where do we spend our money? We'll show ourselves and others what is important to us. If that's all somebody had to look at of your life, that was the only picture they got. Your checkbook register and your calendar. What would they see your priorities are? I'm afraid mine would probably not show what I want it to show. Time for more practice. James ends our reading today with a, a, a call for patience. Be patient, he says, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty lousy at being patient. Again, more practice is needed. 
Be patient, James says, just as the farmer is patient in waiting for the crop. Be patient. The Lord is coming. It's an interesting contrast from the beginning of our reading, which in essence told us to hurry up and do what we need to do because nothing is guaranteed. But now be patient with ourselves, with God, and with others. Again, as I read this ending about being patient, I'm reminded of some advice I heard Itzhak Perlman give. Um, he's got some videos out there where aspiring musicians have written in and asked him for advice, and so he reads their letters and then responds to them. And He told this particular student to, to keep practicing but not to rush things. He said, be extremely careful to get each note, each fingering exactly the way you want it before moving on. And he said something so interesting. He said, what we learn slowly, we remember for a long time. But what we learn quickly, we just as quickly forget. So friends, if you are not where you want to be, where you think God wants you to be, in your discipleship, in your generosity, in your faith, keep at it. Keep practicing. Be methodical, slowly, repetitiously doing what God is calling you to do. And the habits that you form will last for eternity. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we move into our time of prayer, um, I have just a couple joys and concerns that I want to lift up, and then I'll open it for you to share as, the, as well. I see Marla back there way at the back. There's a joy in your family this week. Marla has a new grandson. Nick and Jessica had a baby boy. Lincoln James, am I getting that right? Yes. Um, and I don't remember the weight and the length and all of that, but he's beautiful and he's healthy and mom and baby are doing good. And so we give thanks to God for that, and may God just bless their family and bless Lincoln all the days of his life. We uh, had another hurricane hit in the southern part of the U.S. this week, um, again in Louisiana and Mississippi and down in that area. And so we, we pray for all of those who are affected by the hurricane, who are still recovering from the last one in a lot of cases. Um, may, may God just be with them and give them the strength to, to persevere and push through and, and be safe and, and do what they can to, to rebuild and get back to normal. Um, we had a couple of incidents in, in the vicinity this week with some fires. A uh, combine caught on fire, I heard. There was the fire at the slough. Um, we just are remembering that this is, can be a dangerous time for folks. Um, Harvest, of course, brings its own um, set of dangers and concerns, and so we pray for all of those involved in the harvest that they stay safe and well. Um, but also, with just as dry as it is, the fire danger is real, and so we pray for safety for not only all the people, but the livestock and the land as well. Are there joys and concerns that you would lift up this morning? Bobby. Yeah, um, just to repeat that so everyone heard, Aurora, uh, baby Aurora has made her, <laughs> her entrance into the world. Bobby has a great granddaughter, my goodness. So little Aurora is doing well and has two big brothers who will keep her in line. So again, we pray God's blessings on all of them. Um, there also was a terrible accident west of town here the other morning. And so we pray for those who were injured um, in that um, we pray for their recovery. We also give thanks to all the first responders who responded to that accident. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? If not, I invite you into a time of silent prayer, and then I'll guide us through the remainder of our prayer time. Let us pray.
Gracious God, we come before you today in humble thanks. Thanks for this beautiful time of year when all of the leaves are changing, the harvest is coming, and we can see you at work in all of creation around us. Lord, we ask today for patience. For the patience to, to have with ourselves when we aren't where we want to be in our lives, in our faith, in whatever journey we may be on. But may we not waste any opportunities, Lord. You have given us the gift of today. May we take that gift and run with it. Open our eyes and our hearts to see ways that we can bless others each and every day. Whether that is through an act of service, a kind word, a smile, or a gift. Help us to be aware. Help us to respond as you would have us respond. Lord, you have heard the prayers that we have lifted to you today. The ones that we have spoken aloud and the ones that we whisper deep in our hearts. You know the needs, Lord, better than we do. Enter into the lives of those who need you and touch them and bless them as only you can. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is For the Fruits of All Creation. For the fruit of all creation, thanks be to God. For his gifts to every nation, Thanks be to God. For the plowing, sowing, reaping, silent growth while we are sleeping, future needs in earth's safekeeping, thanks be to God. In the just reward of labor, God's will is done. In the help we give our neighbor, God's will is done. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and the despairing, in the harvests we are sharing, God's will is done. For the harvest of the Spirit, thanks be to God. For the good we all inherit, thanks be to God. For the wonders that astound us, for the truths that still confound us, most of all, that love has found us. Thanks be to God. God has blessed each and every one of us with so much so much goodness, so much kindness, so many blessings. Let us go and be a blessing to those we encounter. Go in peace. Amen. Just remain seated and the ushers will dismiss you.